Thanks for tuning in to Scar Stories. Today, I'm starting a new series called Invisible. And for the next few weeks, we'll be hearing from some really brave people. People that to many of us are invisible. Orphaned, imprisoned, homeless, even human trafficking. Today, I talk about homelessness with Anthony from On Your Feet, Detroit. Check this out. Hey, you guys, welcome to Scar Stories. And I'm so excited for our new series, Invisible, which is starting this week. And I have with me a really awesome guest. I know you guys are going to enjoy this interview so much. His name is Anthony Guastella. Did I get that right, Anthony? Yes. <laughs> awesome. And he is he works with an organization actually here in my hometown of Detroit that's called uh, Get On Your Feet Detroit, right? Yep. On Your Feet awesome. Detroit. Or On Your Feet Detroit. I'm sorry. And On Your Feet Detroit. And they work with homeless people and trying to really help fill those gaps and helping people recover and get out of this predicament. And one thing I love about this series, and Anthony, I shared a little bit with you about this, is that we're going to be talking about some of the people in our world that we don't always notice or we take for granted. And we might see them in our cars. And I think that's become such a common thing in recent years where you see a lot more homeless people like with signs or they're out of work or things like that. And I know sometimes that's not even true. Um, there can be people that are pulling scams and stuff, and it's hard to really wrap our head around what's legit and what isn't, and even how we can help. And really, there's, I think there's some, such a misunderstanding, too, of how people even get into this position, because we know it's real, and we know that not everyone's in this position because of you know, drug addiction or something like that, even though there are some that are. There's still other facets to this. And we're going to talk about this and unpack this today together. So I'm really excited about that because I know you've got such a, a great story to share and you can give us your front row seat perspective on this as this is something that's really close to your heart. So um, thank you for being with us on this show. And I look forward to our interview. So first of all, to start things off, Anthony, tell me how you first got involved in On Your Feet Detroit. Yeah. So, you know, like a lot of us growing up in Metro Detroit, um, experience looking at people who experience homelessness you know it's not something that we see day in and day out right i grew up in a suburb north of detroit um, and there were people on the corners um, growing up so really my only exposure was when i would go downtown to a sports game uh, i don't know if anyone else remembers the detroit vipers a minor league hockey team um, mm -hmm. but you know going down to games at the joe lewis arena um, and just seeing people on the streets begging for money, going to those events, that, that really stirred something. Um, as a young child, I attended a, a Catholic church in my town. And each year we would do a warming center initiative uh, to house people who were experiencing homelessness for a weekend. Um, you know, my mom always tells these funny stories of how every year without fail, I'd come up with someone and say, hey, mom, this is my new friend, Mark. I told him he could spend the night at our house because we have extra space. Um, and, you know, it, it's something that helping the homeless has always been something that's been on my heart. Um, but it's never really something that I thought I could make an impact, right? Because when you look at the problem of homelessness, it's, it's not one size fits all issue. It's not a one solution fits all issue either, right? There's so many reasons that people get led into this really just vicious cycle of homelessness. Right. And so it was really overwhelming at first in trying to think of well, what do I do? Um, and I really got involved when I started my graduate studies at Wayne State University School of Medicine. Uh, I was going for my PhD in cancer biology. Uh, I moved down to Detroit and living there and being downtown day in and day out, I just saw the same people on the streets. And eventually this little tug on my heart said, stop seeing them and go talk to them, right? Don't just keep driving by them, but uh, get out, get on your feet. And so right. really how it started is in between classes and different experiments, uh, I would just leave the lab, leave the campus and just start walking the streets of Detroit. Um, and there were two people that really made a big impact. Uh, well, I, a handful of people. Uh, I had a buddy, William, who was experiencing homelessness and uh, he was right on my way to work every day. I'd stop and say hi to him, uh, make sure he didn't need anything. Uh, I'd bring water bottles, you know, different things like that and just started building a relationship with him. And gosh, we hung out for maybe two, almost three years uh, until we just lost connection. You know, that's 
one tough thing about working with people experiencing homelessness is it's a very transient population, right? They're not always going to be at the same spots. You're not always going to be able to meet them at the same time. Um, but it, it was really those personal connections with William, uh, also with Tyrone and Tasha. They were a couple that I met um, that it was just incredible. Once you start hearing their stories, right? right, you can start seeing the similarities between our own life and their life and how right. really, I truly believe that, you know, we're all one big financial burden away from becoming homeless, right? Mm. Uh, yeah. One of the stories that sticks out to me the most uh, was a man I met named Ian. And this man um, was a mechanical engineer, had mm. a great job, great family, a wife, a child. Um, he went through a rough patch. He lost his daughter. Mm. He and his wife got a divorce. He had an accident at work that left him in a wheelchair, needed a place to recover. Um, he initially was from Seattle, but moved to be with family members in the Boston region on the East Coast. And through a string of unfortunate events, he was kicked out of the house he was staying in uh, and was left on the streets of Boston with nothing. He had no ID, no birth certificate. So he was on the streets and had no way of getting off, right? And so I think that circling back to your initial question, how I got <laughs> right. started with it was really talking to people and hearing their stories. And, and that's why I'm so excited to be a part of this podcast with you and trying to bring light to the invisible people, right? Yeah. Because homelessness, the biggest thing that these people struggle with is that isolation mm. and that disconnection from society. Right. And I, I think if we all kind of think back to the last time we saw someone begging, right, or asking for help, did we really look at them in the eyes or right. did we kind of look away? Did we cross the street? Did we turn our shoulder? You know, all of these things really, when you start taking stock, it's like, whoa, yeah, we really don't see these people. Right. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just been something that ever, ever since, uh, you know, really walking the streets of Detroit and meeting these people where they are, um, ever since then, it's like, wow, I, when, if I drive by someone on the street corner, I'll just wave at them and smile um, because that's something that's so needed um, for that group right. of people. I really, that's so great what you shared. And I think, you know, it makes me think too, um, when we were talking last week and you had shared about even just like knowing their name or calling them by name and how that was so important. And I just, it kind of goes along with what you're saying. It's like really being seen and being treating them with that respect and honor, even though they're in this position that I know there's so much shame attached, you know, and it's like so many things that happen to us in life that shame is this thing that's so ugly that can happen through, you know, maybe a bad experience we've had or things like that. But then it can also be obviously in this position, there's this expectation that, um, we're supposed to, you know, make money and live in a certain environment. And then we can't live up to that. Or we do have, like you were sharing, horrible circumstances that can put us in this predicament that we would have never dreamed could happen. And yet here we are. I mean, it's so quick. We're so quick to judge. And we think that we're not judging, but we really are. We're judging. You know, we don't really know. And it's so easy to say, well, they're just lazy or, well, they've got, you know, that like they had some kind of hand in it. And I'm sure there are some people that do. Um, but you know, it, it's still, it doesn't change that here they are in this horrible spot. And so many of them, like you, like the story you shared about Ian, you know, wasn't his choice. He's, he had really just a series of things happen and it's, you know, which is so scary. Cause I mean, that could really, like you said, we're all only one horrible financial crisis away. I mean, I'll tell you, and the, yeah. I think the pandemic was something that made me realize that. Cause like we were talking even before we started our interview, it's been hard as an artist, what I do for a living has completely been annihilated through the pandemic. So you think about that stuff and you're just like, it makes you look at that, those things differently. And I think sometimes maybe going through hard times can be something that reminds us all it's humbling, you know, because we realize like, you know, for the grace of God there, you know, that could be me, you know, it doesn't yeah. take a lot. It's a, it's a shorter, it's a shorter journey than we might realize, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, prime example in my life, right. I'm in college, I'm working at a restaurant, full-time student, full-time working in a restaurant, doing some um, 
helping students in high school with math tutoring. Well, why I couldn't think of the word. Uh, doing some uh-huh. tutoring on the side as well. And uh, I'll never forget, it was a Saturday about six o'clock. We were in the middle of a dinner rush. And I get a phone call. My phone keeps going off, going off, going off. I'm like, what is going on? I'm at work right now. I step out and it's my roommate. And he said, Anthony, our apartment's been broken into. Ah. So working in the service industry, you know, part of my pay was cash. And so in my bedroom, I had my next three months rent ready to go. I had money for all my bills. And I come home and my bedroom was torn apart. They took my TV, my laptop for school, my camera equipment. Uh, they took my video game system. They took all the cash in my room. Oh, um, no. And honestly, in that moment, if my parents hadn't said, Anthony, move back home with us. Don't worry about it. We'll help you get on your feet. Where would I be right now? Mm. You know? And so really, when, when I heard Ian's story, it, it just instantly that story popped up like, oh, my gosh. I could have been on the streets. You know, it's, it's so easy. Now, of course, like you said, there are some people who struggle with addictions, right? And we have to remember that drug addictions, alcohol addictions are in the brain. They're chemical imbalances. These are, are real diseases that need to get helped. And a lot of the reason that we see so many people with mental health issues, with addictions on the street, because a lot of those hospitals that helped those patients were shut down. Mm. And so now these people have nowhere to go but the streets. Wow. And, you know, it, it's, it's really sad, too, that there's such a stigma to people, right? I, I think, like you said, that making eye contact and, and engaging someone by saying their name or even asking for their name is just such, I don't know, it's something that's missing, in these people's lives. You know, I was watching a, a TED talk the other night on what are the most, uh, what are the factors that most predict your uh, longevity of your life, right? How, mm-hmm. how can we improve our overall life expectancy? Right. Diet and exercise, we're not one and two. Do you know what number one and two were? The number one thing to improve your health was social integration. Mm. being a part of society. Wow. Number two was deep social connections. Mm. Those were two things that more than anything, more than quitting smoking, more than quitting drinking, more than exercising weight, those two factors had the biggest impact on that. And so what is that? Right. And what does that tell you? That people experiencing homelessness just right off the bat are already at a disadvantage because they are so isolated and cut off. Like you mentioned, the, the shame factor is, is just, it's tough, yeah. right? Because think about how difficult you, you have no way of providing for yourself, right? You have to rely on other people for everything. And how difficult um, that is mentally on people, I think, is something that um, has really surprised me over the years. You know, I've been working with this population for coming on seven years now. Um, Mm. And it's, you know, I I think one of the hardest things initially was creating that boundary, right? Creating this, this emotional boundary, if you will, because it's so easy to hear someone's story and just be like, I I have to help this person now. I I have to do this. Right. Uh, I have to do something. Right. And, And actually by giving people handouts, you actually can hurt them more than you realize, because by, you know, just giving someone money, right, for example, you're now taking away their opportunity to work for it, not saying that they can go get a job or anything like that, but you're, you're taking away their opportunity to do something about it and to give them that, um, just that personal touch and bettering themselves, you know, so it's, it's been a journey of trying to figure out how to best help these people. And I mean, really, I think what it comes down to is just talking, smiling, having eye connections, referring to them in their first name um, Mm -hmm. is something. And just hearing their story, I think has been the thing that has really impacted um, people the most. Right. Well, yeah, because that, and that kind of brings up, um, we're kind of covering some of my questions I wanted to ask you just in our discussion, which is great. Um, But that kind of, 
points to maybe some misconceptions about the homeless community. I think my, like, cause one of my initial thoughts is that when we see these people, your instinct is, well, if I'm really this, you know, to really acknowledge them, I should give them money or I should maybe bring them a meal or something. And I think, I mean, you want to, you know, you want to be able to do something and give something to them. And yet at the same time, you know, the reality is that even just doing something like that, it's not changing their position. You're just sort of kicking the can, so to speak. You're not, you know what I mean? Like it's helping them maybe for a minute and it's kind certainly, but it doesn't solve the bigger issue, which is getting them out of this. And I, um, that's very interesting perspective, what you're sharing. Cause I mean, there is a certain amount of pride of being able to like make money, um, you know, for working and for doing something. Cause it's, it's our self-respect, you know, we get our self-respect for, for, you know, obviously getting paid for doing something, which is what we want. We want to be contributing something, you know, yeah. to the world. And can you tell us, um, tell us like, what is the process? Like as you're working with these people, what, how do we get, how do we really truly help them then? So if we're not, I mean, aside from just being kind and making eye contact and building that relationship, obviously the bigger goal of, you know, working with the homeless community is to eliminate even the homeless community, to be able to put everybody back to work and, you know, be able to recover from this extreme poverty and hopelessness. So what is, Tell us more about that process. Like what is the journey of from homelessness to getting back, you know, fixing your life basically. Yeah, no. And, and um, it's tough. That that was something that I had to really wrestle with early on. Right. I'm I'm a very um, goal driven person. Right. So my goal, when I started on your feet, Detroit, which I, I laugh about now because I'm like seven years later, I'm like, all right, young Anthony, calm down. (laughs) <laughs> but, you know, my goal was really to end homelessness in Detroit, yeah. right? And, again, it, it is such an overwhelming issue when you really spend time with it and sit. And, and it also requires someone who's ready to take that step out of homelessness. Because one, one of the biggest things that happens is over time, this really vicious cycle of homelessness, the shame that comes with it, and just the the mental struggles that these people go through, um, they have to be ready to step out of homelessness and say, no, I am worth it, mm-hmm. right? I, I am worth putting this work in. You know, um, a lot of the people on the streets don't have a driver's license, don't have state ID, don't have their social security card, right? So my my buddy, William, he became homeless after a horrendous string of events. He was diagnosed with lung cancer. His wife died, his mother died. While he was in the hospital, he had a friend staying at his house. He said, hey, please take care of my bills, take care of my house until I come out of the hospital. I don't have anyone to help me. He gets out of the hospital, his house was sold, all his belongings were sold, oh. and he had no identification, oh no social goodness. security card. He had nothing. So for years, he couldn't even apply for Section 8 housing. He couldn't even begin the initial steps, right? Mm-hmm. And so driving by William, you would just wave and be like, oh, this guy's on the streets because of his drug and alcohol addiction. Now, granted, he may have been using drugs. He may not. That's neither here nor there. You know, that's, that's something to that. I think a lot of us judge a little too quickly right. when we see someone on the streets, right? Because it's like, hey, I, I have it together, right? And a lot of these people, I mean, they're still people. Right. They're still someone who now has to come to terms with the fact that they're in a different situation. Um, so with William, for example, I, I built a relationship with him over years, heard his story, um, felt like he really had a heart that said, I'm ready to take this step. Mm-hmm. And so I helped get him his ID card back. I took him to the social security office to get him signed up for his benefits, to get a new card sent to him. We got his birth certificate and um, I stopped seeing him on the streets and I'm hoping that's because he got put into Section 8 housing and right. started to really get reintegrated back. You know, one of my next projects, I'm, I'm a big dreamer here at On Your Feet Detroit. <laughs> I, I really love to come up with, all right, what's the next thing we're going to do? And one of my dreams is to come up with a list of employers 
who would hire someone who is recently homeless. Oh, I love that. That's so helpful. So that, yeah, because, you know, think of it this way too, right? You're homeless. You just got all of your documents and everything. Where do you go to look for a job? And right. when you go there and you don't have all the information of, well, where were you living for the last five right. years? It's more what shame. previous address? It's yes. more shame, right? Yeah. So that is something that over time I've noticed is, you know, I, I go to these people, I'm like, all right, let, let's go on, get on your feet and go get a job. And they're like, who's going to hire me? Right. Who's going to sit here and think I'm reliable? Like, you know, so mm. I've started reaching out to some different people like landscaping companies who may need seasonal work, snow removal, sure. uh, different things like that. Just trying to dream up of, okay, look, if we want these people to get off the streets, we have to give them a helping hand. Sure. Everyone needs a helping hand every now and then. And, oh, you know, that's, that's really where the, the name of the organization, On Your Feet Detroit, comes right. from, right? Because we understand that homelessness homelessness knocks you off your feet sure. and just knocks you down and everyone needs a helping hand to get on their feet. Right. Well, you know, you know what I love about that too, Anthony, is that it's really, it goes to show you too, that for us to really, um, to really remedy a solution like this, because this is really, we have to almost look at it like it's our problem as a society and as a culture, and we can all contribute to the solution. And maybe like what you're saying, I mean, Yes, you know, making, you know, making that eye contact and passing people and being kind is certainly something we should all be doing all the time. But beyond that, it goes to show you too, like, as far as developing like these lists for like places where people can get employment and things like that, that shows you that these are things that like are deeper than just, you know, it's, there's so many, so many areas we could all be contributing, I guess, is what I'm trying to express. And that really, that gives me so many ideas, just you expressing that, because there, there's really, it sounds like there's a journey from being homeless to recovering and really being a full member of society where you're getting out of that position, you know? And it's yeah. so wonderful that you, you, what you're doing is learning about these steps and kind of putting yourself in their shoes. Like if you were them, how would you do this? Or how would you feel? And then making yeah. it easier. Because I think that's the other thing is it's as a society, because we're so judgy, we make recovering so difficult for so many things, whether it's, you know, I did a series on addiction and, and, and I think that's something that we've had more information and education in recent years, which is great because it's allowed us all to increase our compassion and to realize that this is, this is a gradual journey and to make it, we can't, we can't attach so much shame to some of these problems and so much judgment and expect people to be able to recover. We have to and I think that's what you're saying too, that I love. It's like, we all have to realize that we could all have these problems if the circumstances were right. And it should increase our compassion to the point that we want to get involved and help. And we want to be able to support an organization like yours, for example, that you're, you guys are creating like basically a blueprint of like, look, if you're homeless, we have a, a blueprint here and a plan to help you get out of this. And it's going to be hard and scary, but we're going to make it as easy as possible. And we're going to give you the tools and that you, we're going to create that community that can like journey with you through this process. So you're not having to do it by yourself. And I think that is beautiful and awesome. And I love that. So that's so cool. So, so tell us a little bit more. So once they get their papers and things like that, that's awesome. So does on your feet Detroit help with that? Like, is that something you regularly do is, create an environment where you can get, you know, the paperwork that everybody needs to be able to get into Section 8 housing? I mean, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so that's something that we are trying to work with. You know, I think one of the biggest things I learned when I entered this realm of trying to help people experiencing homelessness, mm -hmm. um, besides the, the proper verbiage that we're supposed to use, you know, it's not a homeless person, it's a person experiencing homelessness, right? Right. Even just changing the way that you put those words together right. in your mind already is like, oh, okay, this is a real person who's just experiencing homelessness. Right. It doesn't um, define them, you know? It doesn't define them, right? right? So even just beyond learning the verbiage is there are so many organizations out there who are trying to help and make a difference, right? So at On Your Feet, I, you know, being a scientist, right, I, I did my... PhD studies, I studied brain tumors at Wayne State and Carmanos Cancer Institute. And so uh, in the scientific world, right, we understand that we need to collaborate and bring the experts in at the different areas. So 
Right now, we're trying to partner with people who are experts at doing that paperwork, right? So with William, that was kind of like my uh, beta launch, if you will, into this idea of I want to bring together social workers, lawyers, potentially, um, you know, maybe like a, a once a month type situation where we'll have those people come in and they can just on the spot help people figure out, okay, what do I need? Who can I go to? Who can I call? Because right. like you said, um, that activation energy required to even break out of homelessness requires not just a lot of doing, but a lot of hope. Right. And that's something that I think people don't realize, right? Is when you're on the streets and you're, you're going through this just traumatic experience, I mean, put yourself in those shoes. One day you have a house, a wife, kids, and the next you're on the streets. And right. time moves differently when you're sitting on the streets. It's very, you know, sitting there all day, every day, just yeah. really takes a toll on you. But you yeah. get comfortable with that. Right. You know what to expect every day. Okay, hey, if I go to this corner, I can be on this corner from this time to this time. I can make X amount of money and this can happen, right? Whereas if you start saying, I'm going to put myself out there and I'm going to apply for this housing, I'm going to apply for this. That's a lot of hope that some of these people just can't even give that. They don't have anything left in their emotional tanks. Sure. So um, I think we forget about that. We forget about the toll that this takes. You know, it's really easy yeah. when people are down. Cause I know even my own life, you know, and, and just, I'm sure you can relate to like, look, we all go through times where we feel discouraged or down and, you know, wow. You know, like if we stayed there or if things really were in a situation where it was even worse or even darker or even more hopeless, yeah. I mean, and hope is such a hope is everything in life. And I think that's, I know we both share such a strong faith and I know that is such a big part of you know, our strength and recovery is knowing that God does love us, even when we're in these horrible, dark experiences, that he does give us hope and that he is taking care of us, even when it doesn't feel like it. And even when, you know, and I think, you know, it's funny because I, you probably have heard this before, um, you know, many people ask sometimes, well, like, why are, you know, if God is real, like, how come there is homelessness in the world? And I heard a pastor once address this and he said, well, you know, you know, he's kind of, God also has given us this perspective and opportunity to help fix these things. You know what I mean? So it's almost like yeah. I'm sending you to help. Like, <laughs> why don't you go, you know, you're right. They are out there. So, you know, if you believe in God's love and you want to pass that on, we should all be helping more. And I know everyone believes different things, but I mean, that's something I know I feel that I want to do with my little podcast here is building awareness for some of these things so that we can have opportunities, which everybody, we're going to have some links in the show notes where you can maybe get involved or support on your feet. Detroit, for those of you who are listening, because I know everyone that listens to this podcast and not, a, not all of you live in uh, Michigan. There's many people all over the world that listen to this, but we're going to have some links because every country and city and state uh, has this issue, you know? And so I've got to believe there's, you know, things going on in every city where you can get involved and help. And the point is, is to be aware of it and to think, you know, how can I extend, you know, what I have and share my gifts, share my resources to maybe help improve this so that other people can have a chance to recover. So, but hope is so important. And I love what you're saying about that because, you know, it's, it's a practical way to give them that because that hopefully can help balance out some of that darkness and hopelessness is realizing like, well, maybe there is a path out of this, you know, maybe there is a yeah. way, you know, and, and I've got to believe people, that feels good. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. And, you know, giving people the ability to love themselves yeah. is something to, and, and to remind people that you're worthy of love, right? Like, as you mentioned, we both share strong faith, right? But one thing that I've been very adamant about with On Your Feet Detroit is I don't want this to be an organization where we're pushing religion or we're trying to, in our first interaction, going up to someone and saying, do you believe in Jesus, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I feel like that is just a really difficult way to get the message of what being a Christian is, which is, I mean, if you read the scriptures and you look at it, the number one commandment is to love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. It's to yeah. love your God and to love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? And that's such an important portion of that phrasing is love your neighbor as you love yourself. 
And so as people are listening to this, you know, I, I encourage you, I've been on a journey myself of learning how to love myself better. And I really think that as I've served people experiencing homelessness, I was sitting over here like, oh, I'm going to be helping all these people and making such an impact on them. And when I reflect now, I go, wow, it's changed me so much more than I think it may have even changed them, you know, as a, as a husband, just, just realizing how much I need to cherish every moment with my wife in my home, with my daughter, uh, soon to be son coming up in September. Um, and, and really just taking stock of all of those things and mm. just realizing how precious those moments are. And, and, you know, as I've started to love myself more and started to, you know, look at all these past pains that may have happened, all these things that may have at the time knocked me off my horse and made me think I, it was hopeless, you know, but looking back now and saying, how can I take that pain and convert that to my platform, you know, kind of even circling back to your first question of how did I get involved? And I really feel like my connection with people experiencing homelessness is loneliness. Right. As a kid in middle school, high school, I was always a bigger kid and I used to get made fun of a lot. Right. Uh, I can remember back uh, football practices before school started, we used to do two a day football practices and the whole football team would all get together and eat lunch. Um, well, I didn't have any friends on the team at the time. So I used to spend my lunches just sitting in a stairwell, eating lunch by myself. Right. Mm -hmm. And looking back now, I go, wow, all those moments of isolation at the time were horrible, devastating, so difficult. But now I say, well, look at this. I can resonate with these people. I, I found a people group that at the core I can connect with. And so if, if you're listening to this, you know, start looking back on your life, start evaluating what were some major pains, even, you know, a great exercise is to take a blank sheet of paper and draw a line down the middle. On one side is your birth. On the other side is where you are right now. And just draw out good, bad, ugly, just draw out your biggest memories and just look at that and say, where are my pain points and what people group can I now say, Hey, you're going through what I went through. I made it through. Okay. Now let me help you. Right. That's so beautiful. And That's awesome. I think if, yeah. If people started doing that more, how different would the world be? Right. You know, we don't have to, you don't have to be a Christian to show love to someone or to have compassion or to put yourself in their shoes. So right. that's, that's what I, I really want to spread that just love and positivity with yeah. on your feet, Detroit. And, you know, people, if you don't live in Michigan and you can't be a part of helping through on your feet, Detroit directly, um, wherever you are, you can bag up some lunches. You can go to the park. You can talk with people. You know, remember those, the two most important factors to living a long life, social integration and deep social connections. Yeah. Just by smiling, saying hi, carry water bottles in your car. If you drive by people a lot, um, carry water bottles and just hand a water bottle out and just say, hey, thinking about you. I hope you have a good day. I don't have any cash on me, but here's a water bottle. Here's a snack pack. Right. Um, you know, anything... Uh, goes a long way to this population. Right. That's awesome. I love that. And I love, I love what you're saying too, because I think so, so much, so many of us hesitate to get involved because we think, well, we don't have anything to offer or we don't have training or I don't have a psychiatry degree or, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> there's so many different areas, especially like at the internet now, I think we've become so super hyper exposed to um, all these different things, you know, all these different causes. And, you know, like it, you, all you have to do is go to Instagram and you're like scrolling and it's like, you know, there's dogs that need help and there's, you know, there's everybody needs help and, and you get so overwhelmed with all of it. And I think we forget that some of the basic things that we can offer is just ourselves and our community and our friendship. And I think, and that's something we can all do, you know, maybe a better job of. And, and I think that's what I love about, you know, talking about this issue, because I think it's one that we all, we all know about and we all sort of feel uncomfortable with. And that's why I like, yeah. I love to talk about it because I don't want us to feel uncomfortable. I want us to look at it and go, well, wait, let's not feel uncomfortable. Let's be part of the solution. And we all have a role and maybe not everyone like, 
you know, you're saying not everyone can get directly involved and some people are called to different roles and facets of that um, solution. But at the very least, we can be aware and we can make a point of when we do maybe have some things in our car so that when people we do maybe run across somebody, we've got something prepared that we can be like, Hey, you know, like looking for ways, like being intentional about trying to be a blessing to other people, you know, versus, you know, I know myself, I can get so self-absorbed. I'm not, you know, I've got my list every day and I don't want to be interrupted. And I think one of one thing I'm learning in my journey is like, and I pray about this all the time is that I would be interruptible Mm. and I wouldn't be so absorbed in my list that I don't see the people around me that might need some kindness or some encouragement. Or in this situation, I'm driving in my car and I see somebody like not hesitating to stop and extend a hand. So I'm excited to like share those links with everybody. So um, right now, as you kind of move through um, on your feet, Detroit, and you're, it sounds like you are still building and adding programs to this, you know, process of trying to really offer people this road to recovery after, um, after you have these meetings, like you mentioned, you have these, um, sorry, I'm like losing my train of thought the moments that you have like these monthly like things where you're having like attorneys come in and things like that. Is there, what happens next? Like after that? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's been sad, but COVID has really put a damper, you know, COVID has changed everyone's life, right? We used to do, uh, we used to partner with a group called Elevate Detroit who hosted community barbecues um, and we would be down there and talking with people, interacting, smiling, sharing a meal with them. Um, our mode of operation has changed since then. So um, we're kind of in a new phase of On Your Feet Detroit outreach. Um, I'm hoping to still get that portion up and running. But right now, I'm working with an organization called The Wave Project. Um, and I have been working with them now for a few years, um, and we just launched our essentials van, we're calling it. So um, this is a van, it's a like work van that you would see like a carpenter have, and we converted it inside, we put shelves in there, we put a couple uh, racks for clothing, and what we're doing is we are driving around Metro Detroit looking for people on the streets And we have things like socks, underwear, uh, flip-flops, hygiene kits, deodorant, toothpaste, shampoo, all these different items um, that people need, right? Because now we can't have these large gatherings. Hopefully soon we can start up safely with those. Um, But, you know, the homeless population is really scary to work with during COVID because a lot of them have comorbidities, aren't getting proper nutrition, don't have access to health care. So it's a really right. scary group to work with um, during a global pandemic. But um, yeah. it's really exciting for this Essentials Band because we are going to where they are. We're meeting them where they are. Um, and oh, so, sorry. you know, that's, that's really exciting. So what the next steps are is just continuing to be flexible and just kind of going with the flow at On Your Feet. Um, right. We're really trying to just bring awareness to people experiencing homelessness, trying to bring some humanity back to these people. And, you know, if, if there's one thing that listeners take away from today, it's that love. It's the word love, mm-hmm. right? If we all just started loving our neighbors and, you know, again, in the Bible, they define the term neighbor as anyone on earth, right? <laughs> right. So if, if we all just started loving our neighbors and like you said, not being so quick to judge, not being such a, you know, right or wrong society, but really trying to look at people and see ourselves in them mm-hmm. and say, how, how would I want to be treated if I was in this situation? I, I really think that the impact is just profound that we could make because everyone has their scar stories. I, I yep. love that, <laughs> that title, right? And so just yeah. connecting and, and resonating with people. And, mm. you know, the homeless population is not going to be for everyone, right? Not everyone is going to be as comfortable as me to just walk up to a stranger and start talking with them. Right. Um, but find your people group and start right the process. You know, uh, I really encourage people, if if you do want to get involved helping the homeless, do a quick Google search, see what organizations are working by you. Um, You know, I was attending classes at Wayne State and had no idea 
that Elevate Detroit was hosting weekly barbecues in a park right around the street from my lab. For years, I didn't know what was going on. And then once I started searching, I was like, oh, well, I I don't have to reinvent the wheel helping (laughs) people experiencing homelessness, right? I I can actually just join them. They have something that's going on. It's great. (laughs) Same thing with the WAVE project. You know, their, their main focus is providing showers to people who are experiencing homelessness because hygiene is such a big thing. Again, that shame cycle. Sure. You can't shower and you know that you're dirty. How can you go to a job interview? Right. So um, they just had a great woman. Uh, they were live streaming their shower services and a woman experiencing homelessness said that. She said, oh my gosh, I feel like a million bucks now. I'm going to go to this job interview that I was putting off because I just thought I was too dirty to go. Right. Paraphrasing what she said, but that's so just, oh, that's, that's, that's why we put all this time in and, and all this energy into mm-hmm. our organizations is for those little moments where people can just feel like people again. So, you know, definitely um, check out our website on your feet, Detroit.org. Um, there's a lot of stories, pictures up there. Uh, you can also make tax deductible donations on the website. We're also on Venmo at On Your Feet Detroit. And um, yeah, you know, it's, it's funny because everyone is kind of like, oh, I don't want to donate money to an organization, right? So we also have you covered there. If you'd like to donate <laughs> items to help fill our essentials van, we actually have an Amazon wish list while you're ordering a book or the latest gadget you saw from Facebook that you have to have on uh, mm-hmm. off Amazon. You can add a few clothing items or different things to help uh, people experiencing homelessness. And I think that's also an exciting opportunity too, right? Is even if you don't live in Michigan, even if you don't live in the United States, you can make an impact in someone's life that you'll never meet, you'll never get a thank you for, but you are making a difference in the world. Yeah, that's awesome, Anthony. Thank you for sharing all that. That's just, I love what you guys are doing. And I'm excited to talk to you more about it because I do live in your city and I'd love to support you guys any way I can. And you guys, we're going to, again, put out all those links in the show notes for you guys. So you'll be able to check out on your feet Detroit more and see how you can help. So thank you so much for all this information. What a great interview. So, and keep yeah, doing what you're doing. Me. Oh, no, my pleasure. And I just keep <laughs> doing what you're doing. I think it's just, it's awesome. It's so awesome. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And, you know, being able to spread awareness about homelessness is definitely uh, something that's great to do. And so I really appreciate this opportunity. uh, And hopefully I can be back and we can talk about how I did end homelessness in 20 years from now. That sounds like a good plan. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Thanks for listening to Scar Stories. You know, if you're inspired by this podcast, we would love it if you left us a review. It helps more people find the show and lets us keep doing this for you guys. I also wanted to invite you to be part of our Scar Stories Facebook community. You can find the link in the show notes. Starting this fall, we're going to have live Q&As and a chance to meet some of our awesome guests. I hope you'll consider joining us. 